What's up guys? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to uh, another audiobook. Today we are reading the third and final story in the Puppet Carver. We are, we are reading Pizza Kit. Uh, I'm really excited for this one. Uh, I've heard good news about it just like I heard good news for Jump for Tickets and I wasn't disappointed by that story. Um, go and watch that if you haven't uh, or read it or whatever. Um, but yeah, we're going to read Pizza Kit today. Um, yeah, very, very, very excited for this one. Just to remind you, this is a reaction uh, and more of a read-through than a, like a full audiobook. Um, so yeah, we're going to get my reaction to this. Um, yeah, we should just get straight into it, I think. Okay. I can't believe you talked me into taking home Ek. Ek? <laughs> uh, who is Ek? Okay. Uh, Peyton said as she sat down with her best friend Marley at a long table in the classroom. Who takes home Ek these days? Come on, it's an easy A. Oh, like home economics. Okay, sorry. I was very confused. Like, who is Ek? <laughs> Marley said, taking a notebook out of her backpack. I mean, look around. How hard could it be? Surveying the classroom, Peyton had to admit that Marley might have a point. The room was lined with kitchen counters, sinks and stoves. There were sewing machines and a headless, armless mannequin for making patterns and adjusting hems. Tucked in one of the corner of the room were a dryer and a washer, or a washer and a dryer. They were going to be graded on laundry? Peyton laughed. Well, it's not exactly the chemistry lab, is it? Nope, Marley said with a grin. And Mrs. Crutchfield is, like, a hundred years old, so she doesn't even know what's going on most of the time. She was my mom's home economics teacher, and mom said she wasn't young back then. She was my mom's home economic teacher too, Peyton said. Mom said that when she was a freshman. Girls were required to take home economics. Wow, that's super sexist, Marley said. What did the boys do while the girls were taking home economics? They took geography. Mom said it was like the school trying... Uh, Mom said it was like the school was saying that boys needed to know their way around the world and girls needed to know their way around the kitchen. <laughs> Too right? Not joking. <laughs> Peyton's mum did know her way around the kitchen, but she also knew her way around the bank where she was a branch manager. Like her mum, Peyton wanted a future where she could balance a career and a family. Good afternoon, young ladies. Peyton and Marley's conversation was interrupted by the quivery voice of Mrs. Crutchfield, who had just tottered into the room. She was a tiny, bird-like woman, wearing a navy blue dotted dress that she could very well have worn back when she was Peyton's mum's teacher, or somebody's grandmother's teacher. And welcome to Home Economics, where you'll be learning the, heart, the art of keeping a gracious home. Peyton rolled her eyes and gave Marley a look, which caused her to have a suppress, to suppress a giggle. Wait, Peyton thought. Wait, they, why, why is the spelling wrong here? Peyton and Peyton. That's, that's really weird. That's really weird. That's happened a few times in this book, actually. It's weird. Wait, Peyton thought. Mrs. Crutchfield had said young ladies. Did that mean there were no boys in the class? She looked around the room. Only girls. So maybe she hadn't changed that much since her mum was in school. Boys were allowed to take home economics now, but apparently they didn't choose to do so. You're going to learn skills such as cooking and cleaning and sewing, Mrs. Crutchfield said, gesturing toward the kitchen equipment and sewing machines in the room. But you're also going to learn the almost lost art of etiquette. Might any of you young ladies be able to use the word etiquette in a sentence? I ate a kit. A uh, Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit. <laughs> Peyton whispered to Marley who laughed. Freddy Fazbear's pizza kits were all the rage, even among high school kids. It was a nostalgia thing, Peyton supposed. Whether it was for a birthday or for no particular reason, visiting the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit factory to build your own pizza was comforting and delicious. Mrs. Crutchfield turned her head toward Peyton. Could you repeat that so the whole class can hear it, please? Peyton felt her, he her face heating up. It was, it was just a stupid joke I whispered to Marley. Yes, Mrs. Crutchfield said. 
and now I'm asking you to share it with the whole class. Peyton knew her face was as red as a tomato. I said, I ate a kit, a peer Freddy Fazbear's Peter kit. A few kids tittered, but the pun didn't seem nearly as funny when she had to say it out loud for everyone to hear. Very amusing, Mrs Crutchfield said. And it's interesting that you mentioned Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit because next week we will be joining the culinary acts, so acts, sorry, culinary arts class for a visit to the factory where they are made. The class erupted in cheers and cries of awesome and yes! Mrs Crutchfield displayed a very slight smile. Permission slips will go out on Wednesday. She looked at Peyton with a stern expression. But now, in all seriousness, can you give the class a definition of the word etiquette? Peyton was more than ready for Mrs Crutchfield's attention to shift elsewhere. Doesn't it mean, like, good manners? Yes, Mrs Crutchfield said. And from now on, I ask you to demonstrate good manners by raising your hand before you speak in my class. Yes, ma'am, Peyton said, barely above a whisper. She wondered if this class was going to be the walk in the park that Marley said it was. Mrs Crutchfield might be old, but it didn't seem like she missed much. Hey, could you set the table while I get the spaghetti cooking? Peyton's mum said. She was still wearing her nice blue blouse and grey dress slacks from work, but she had taken off her pumps and replaced them with, fizz, uh, with fuzzy pink house slippers. Sure, Peyton said, getting up from the couch where she had been aimlessly channel surfing. And thanks to Mrs Crutchfield, I'll set the table 100% correctly so everybody will know we're living in a... She made quotation marks with the index and middle fingers of both hands. Gracious home. Peyton's mum laughed. Yeah, a gracious home where spaghetti with jarred sauce and a bag of pre-made salad are on the dinner menu. Mrs Crutchfield would probably call child protective services if she knew what I'm feeding you. She dropped the contents of a box of spaghetti into a steaming pot of water. How is Mrs Crutchfield doing anyway? The woman has got to be older than dirt. Peyton opened the silverware drawer and retrieved three forks. She still seems pretty sharp. She was sharp enough to call me out when I made some snarky comment to Marley. Yeah, you need to watch those, Mum said, stirring the noodles. I made snarky comments when I was in her class too, so she probably thinks you come by it, honestly. Because I do, Peyton said, smiling. She set the forks to the left of the plates. Mrs Crutchfield said there should be separate forks for the salad and the entree. But Peyton put down one fork. Her plate, put put down one fork, her plate only. Oh, oh my gosh, I can't read. I, I read that as her, but it says per. <laughs> Peyton put down one fork per plate only. Why wash more silverware? I still don't know why you let Marley talk to you, uh, talk you into taking that class, Mum said, stirring the sauce with a wooden spoon. You could have taken art instead. You like art and you're good at it. Are you implying that I'm not good at gracious homemaking? Peyton said, batting her eyelashes theatrically and doing a curtsy. Mum, Mum smiled and shook her head. I'm implying that from the look of your room, you don't care a fig about gracious homemaking. I'm also implying that sometimes you let Marley talk you into things that you wouldn't do otherwise. Peyton sighed. It was an old argument. You don't like Marley. I like Marley fine. Mum said, ripping open the bag of salad and dumping its contents into a bowl. But she has some really strong personality and strong opinions, and I think that sometimes she steamrolls over other people and their wishes and opinions. She doesn't steamroll over me, Peyton said, opening the fridge door to find the parmesan cheese. People did say that Marley is bossy, but that's just because she's a natural leader, Peyton thought. Really? Mum raised an eyebrow. So you're telling me you would have taken home economics even if Marley hadn't suggested it? Peyton hated it when her mum backed her into a corner. Even when you were right, there was no winning an argument with her. Now who's the steamroller? All mums are like that. I'll, I'll be honest, all mums are like that. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have thought to take it, but the way she told me about it, it sounded fun and kind of funny. Well, I hope you find it funny when Mrs Crutchfield grades you on boiling an egg. And gives you a C minus. I'm speaking from experience here. The woman has impossible standards. Peyton sat on her bed, propped up on pillows, 
doing a boring social studies assignment on her laptop. On her walls, posters of the boys from her favourite K-pop group smiled down at her like they were inviting her to abandon her drudgery and go dancing with them instead. Oh god, K-pop is now canon. <laughs> An instant message from Marley popped up on her screen. What are you doing? Peyton welcomed the distraction. Homework? You? Nothing. Bored. You want to go over to the tasty cone? Doing homework, remember? So finish it or ditch it. Who cares? I'll meet you on the corner of Brook and Branch in half an hour. Peyton hesitated before responding. If she were to meet Marley in half an hour, that would mean she'd just have 20 minutes to finish her homework, which wasn't a realistic amount of time for the assignment she had. But a chocolate vanilla swone cone, swell cone, sorry, would taste really good and it was always fun to see who was hanging out at the tasty cone. Molly knew everybody and made easy conversation with them, unlike Peyton, who tended to be on the shy side. But she felt less shy when she was with Marley. Okay, she finally typed, see you in 30. Peyton raced through the rest of her homework assignment, doing what she knew was a slash, was a slap, ja, eh, slap dash job. <laughs> When she came downstairs, her mum and dad were on the couch watching one of those crime shows they found endlessly entertaining, even though every episode seemed identical to Peyton. Hey, Peyton said, already halfway to the front door. I'm going to walk with Marley to the tasty cone. Did you finish your homework? Mum asked. Yes, Peyton said. She didn't do it well, but she finished it. Do you need some money? Her dad asked. Got some, thanks. As Peyton shut the door behind her, she heard her mum call, be home by dark. Molly was standing on the corner of Brook and Branch, as promised. I had to get out of the house, Molly said. Mum and Dad have company. These friends they went to college with, and they're so boring. Every story starts with, do you remember that time? And ends with something totally unmemorable. Peyton laughed. Hey, at least they're trying to have fun. Trying but failing, Molly said. It's pathetic. Do you think you, do you, think you get to be a certain age and then just automatically get boring? I hope not, Peyton said. It was upsetting to think about. One birthday too many, and then you were an adult and incapable of having fun. It was all the more reason to have as much fun as possible now. They walked towards the tasty cone. A boy rode by on a bike and almost wrecked be because he was looking at Marley. It was impossible not to be aware of Marley's beauty. She had golden blonde hair and big blue eyes that somehow unfairly managed to have long, dark lashes. Her body was slim but curvy enough to be feminine. Boys stripped over their feet or over their words when confronted with her. Girls were either too jealous or too insecure to be Marley's friend. But not Peyton. Peyton had no illusions about her own looks. So far, her short, skinny body was so free of curves, she looked like she'd been drawn using a ruler. Her hair and eyes were a dull brown and she had freckles that she hated. But when she hung out with Marley, it she felt like a little of she she felt like a little of Marley's glitter might rub off on her. She was like a plain little sparrow who was best friends with a flamingo. I feel that. Outside the tasty cone, they sat at the, pa uh, the picnic table. Peyton with a chocolate vanilla swirl cone and Marley with a huge banana split. Another thing Peyton had noticed was that Marley could eat whatever she wanted and never seemed to gain an ounce. Don't look at the table behind us, Marley whispered, spooning up ice cream with banana and chocolate sauce. Naturally, Peyton looked. It was a table full of boys who were in their history class, drinking milkshakes and trading insults and laughing the way boys did. I told you not to look, Marley hissed at her. If you tell someone not to look at something, they're automatically going to look, Peyton said. It's like in elementary school when somebody tells you not to do something, then you do it anyway and say it's opposite day. Marley smiled. It was a dazzling smile, even though there was a hot fudge sauce on her upper lip. Sean Adamson is sitting at that table, she whispered. Emma Franklin said that Sean likes me. Peyton rolled her eyes. Marley, it's not like that's newsworthy or anything. All the guys like you. That's not true, Marley blushed, spooning up one more ice cream. <laughs> one more ice cream. Spooning up more ice cream. Well, okay, most guys like me, but most guys are gross. Sean's not gross. He's on the principal's list for good grades, and he's on the basketball team. He's so well-rounded. Plus, he smells good. 
Well, not stinking is important. Peyton said it to be funny, but it was true. A lot of ninth grade boys were not yet on speaking terms with deodorant, a fact that made the school always smell like a giant armpit. <laughs> Why don't you go talk to him? I can't just go talk to him. Marley looked at Peyton like she just said the most ridiculous thing on earth. Okay. Often Peyton felt like there was some kind of script for male-female behaviour that Marley had received but that she had missed out on. Peyton tended to be straightforward with people but apparently straightforwardness with the opposite sex violated some elaborate set of rules that no one had ever bothered explaining to her. Well I can't just go talk to him alone, Marley said. Maybe as we're leaving, we'll walk by his table. If he looks at me, I'll say hi to him. But it has to look casual. Like I just happened to see him as we were leaving. Not like I was going past his table to say hi to him on purpose. Okay, Peyton said again. While hanging out with Marley, there was always so much drama. Peyton sometimes felt like she was a minor character in a play Marley was starring in. Peyton didn't feel like she knew all the lines for this play or even like she quite understood the plot, but it was still entertaining and she was happy that a star like Marley had agreed to let Peyton share the stage with her. Okay, ready? Marley asked as soon as Peyton popped the last, pipe, the last bite of cone into her mouth. Sure, Peyton said, still chewing. They got up from the table and threw away their trash. They walked past the table where the boys were sitting. Peyton watched Marley work. Marley paused by the table just long enough to catch Sean's eye. Oh, hi Sean, she said as if she was surprised to see him there. Peyton noticed that Sean's ears turned red. Hi, Marley, Sean said without making eye contact. Nobody said hi to Peyton, nor she did she expect him to. As she and Marley walked away, she heard the guys teasing Sean and laughing. Oh, hi, Sean, one of them said in an exaggerated... And in, oh my god, I can't say this word. In an exaggeratedly high feminine voice. Marley smiled. Well, that got his attention. I think you already had it, Peyton said. Well, now he knows that I know, which is important. Peyton's grades in school were higher than Marley's, yet often in conversations with Marley, she felt like she was slow to catch on. He knows that you know what? Marley let out an annoyed sounding sigh. He knows that I know that he likes me, you dork. How could somebody be so smart and so stupid at the same time? Peyton smiled and shrugged. I don't know, but with your looks and social skills and my book smarts, if you mixed us together, we'd meet the perfect person. To Peyton's relief, Marley smiled back. We would, wouldn't we? We could take over the world. Hey, I don't feel like going home yet. Why don't we walk down to the park? Peyton looked up at the graying sky. I don't know. I told my mum I'd be home by dark. Marley smiled her charming smile and cocked her head like an adorable puppy. Come on, we'll just stay ten minutes. It won't be full dark for another half an hour. She nudged Peyton's shoulder. We can go to the pond and feed the ducks. Peyton sighed. She had loved ducks ever since she was a little girl. The way they were so graceful in the water and so hilariously clumsy out of it. She loved their blank, serene little faces and their nasal sounding quacks. Okay, just for ten minutes. It's a deal, Marley said. Come on, we'll have more time there if we run. Marley, ra uh, Marley ran gracefully, and Peyton jogged along behind her on short little legs, like a greyhound being pursued by a corgi, Peyton thought. Part, uh, oh my gosh, I'm mixing the names now. <laughs> Peyton and Marley put quarters into the duck food dispensers. At the sound of the pellets pouring from the chute, the ducks swam toward them, then waddled on to land, shaking their wet tail feathers. Here you go, guys, Peyton said, scattering the food on the ground. They bobbed their heads, quacking, and gobbled it up. Marley said, you want it? Go get it! And tossed the food so the ducks had to waggle, or waggle, waddle, waddle. <laughs> waddle. So the ducks, the... Ah. Let me start again. Marley said, you want it? Go get it! And tossed the food so the ducks had to waddle a long way to find it. Some of them weren't bright enough to track where the food had landed, and Marley laughed. You're making them work awfully hard for these pellets, Peyton said, watching the confused ducks wander around. 
Hey, they should get some exercise, Marley said, grinning. People feed them all day long. They're little fatties. They don't look that fat to me, Peyton muttered to herself. But she let Marley have her fun. When the confused ducks finally wandered back her way, though, she made sure to place some food right in front of them. The streetlights came on. Oh no, Peyton said. We've stayed here longer than ten minutes, haven't we? I've got to go. My mum's going to kill me. Marley shook her head. You're such a little rule follower. I guarantee your mum isn't going to kill you. She'd probably just going to yell at you a little, and if she yells at you, so what? Peyton knew Marley wouldn't understand, but the real question, but the real answer to so what was that Peyton didn't like to disappoint her mum. She got along with her parents much better than most kids her age, and she wanted it to stay that way. Let's run, Peyton said. They ran until they reached the corner of Brook and Branch, where they stopped to part ways. Thanks for helping me out with Sean tonight, Marley said, giving Peyton a little half-hug. Tomorrow at lunch, it's his turn to say hi to me, if he knows what he's doing. Which boys usually don't. Marley crinkled her nose, thinking of it, then gave a little wave goodbye and disappeared down her street. It was definitely full dark. As she walked home, Peyton tried to construct her side of the argument she knew she'd have with her mum as soon as she got home. Hi, Peyton, a voice called. Peyton looked over at the house two doors down from hers, where Abigail Sullivan was sitting on the front porch. What kind of person sits on a front porch by herself in the dark? Peyton wondered. But then she, won uh, then she remembered how weird Abigail was, which answered her question. Hi, Abigail, Peyton said, not stopping since she was already late. Now Peyton and Abigail had so little in common that it was strange to think that they were once best friends, because Abigail's house was so close to hers, the two of them had played together as preschoolers, playing dolls and store and school, wetting the sand in the sandbox to make castles and pies. They were inseparable when they started school and stayed that way until seventh grade, when Peyton started being interested in more grown-up things, and Abigail still wanted to play games and talk about wizards and unicorns. Peyton had flung herself in the direction of the popular girls who eventually accepted her. She had left Abigail to fend for herself, sometimes from her spot at the popular girls' table in the school cafeteria. Peyton would see Abigail sitting alone reading a book. I know I'm late, Peyton said as she walked in the front door. She figured she would cut her mum's accusation short by confessing up front. You are, her mum said. I was about to ask your dad to drive around and look for you. Come on, I'm not that late, Peyton said, flopping down on the couch. Her mum was such a worrywart. It was what came of watching all those crime shows on TV. You're late enough. I told you to be home before dark, and you're home after dark, her mum said. Do I need to explain to you what before and after mean? Peyton stifled the urge to roll her eyes. Her mother hated nothing more than an eye roll. No, you don't need to explain what before and after mean. I'm glad to hear it. Her mum's voice was tight with tension. You know, I never worried about you, like this, when you were hanging out with Abigail. Peyton was in no mood for one of her mums. Abigail good, Marley bad lectures. That was because Abigail lives just two doors down. No, it was because Abigail is responsible, and when you were with Abigail, I knew you'd be responsible too. With Marley, I'm not so sure. When Abigail and I were best friends, we were little kids. It wasn't that we were so responsible, it was that an adult was watching us all the time. Marley and I aren't little kids. You haven't got used to the fact that I'm not a baby anymore. Her mum sighed. Peyton, I still think of you as my baby even when you're 30 years old. I recognise that you're growing up, but part of growing up is showing responsibility. If you tell me you'll be home by a certain time, it's your responsibility to make that happen. If you want to be treated like an adult, you have to act like one. The eye roll happened before Peyton could stop it. But seriously, where had her mum gotten that statement? The parents' big book of cliches? Eye rolling. That's very adult, her mum said. Go take a shower and get ready for bed. Peyton dragged herself up the stairs as slowly as she possibly could. She didn't want to push her luck anymore by being openly disobedient. But she also wanted to sh her mum to know that she wasn't happy about following orders. This week, the unit they were studying in home economics was called Eggs, the Basic. <laughs> How to basic. Um, on Monday, Mrs. Crutchfield had lectured them on the uh, nuances of shopping for eggs, which included the importance of checking 
for expiration dates and breakage. They had made both hard-boiled and soft-boiled eggs, which Peyton thought was going to be the easiest cooking assignment ever. She was shocked when Mrs. Crutchfield gave her a B because she didn't wash the egg before boiling it. Seriously? It wasn't like you ate the shell, and besides, didn't boiling water clean things anyway? At least Peyton did better than her mom did when she was in Mrs. Crutchfield's class. Her mom had been getting a C- egg boiler. Tuesday was scrambled eggs, a B plus because they were slightly overdone, and Wednesday was poached, a D plus, and a mess to boot. Peyton was beginning to doubt that the course was going to be easy A, Marley had said it was. Today though, they were having a break from eggs, Mitch's Crossfield laughed entirely too much when she said this, to go on their field trip to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit Factory, where the pizza kits were made. Peyton wasn't that excited about touring the factory, but she was definitely relieved to get away from all those eggs. On the tour, the kids would get to make their own pizza kits, which would be delivered to home economics class the next day. After days of eggs prepared in every way imaginable, a pizza sounded pretty good. Peyton took a seat next to Marley on the bus. The culinary acts, uh, the cu- oh my god, I keep saying culinary acts. The culinary arts class boarded after them, including Sean Anderson, who caught sight of Marley and promptly stumbled into the person in front of him. Marley and Peyton laughed. He's trying to get up the nerve to ask me to do the full dance, Marley whispered after, she, after he was out of earshot. It'd be easier if he didn't fall every time he saw you, Peyton said, and they both giggled. Peyton was glad she could make Marley laugh. She knew she couldn't be the pretty friend, but at least she could be the funny friend. This tour is going to be lame, Marley said. So lame, Peyton said, even though she was actually glad for the break in routine. Freddy Fazbear's for babies, and the sauce on Freddy's pizza tastes like ketchup. The crust is styrofoam, and I don't even know what the cheese is made out of. Marley yawned, Peyton supposed, to demonstrate that she was already bored with the experience even though it hadn't happened yet. Dandruff, Peyton said. The cheese is actually the dandruff of the Freddy Fazbear pizza workers. Uh, they just shake their heads over every pizza. Ew, gross, Marley said, but she was laughing. When they got off the bus, Mrs. Crutchfield read their names from a clipboard and made them line up alphabetically. Now in a moment, the factory manager, Miss Bryant, is going to join us and tell you all about the factory safety regulations. Please play... Oh my god, there's so many typos in this. Please pay close attention. Factories are dangerous places if you don't follow the rules. Molly rolled her eyes. How dangerous could a pizza factory be? Peyton didn't have time to think up a wisecrack because a pretty short black woman, presumably Miss Bryant, came out to join Mrs. Crutchfield. Though the factory manager wore the same kind of net cap cafeteria workers wore on their heads, her body was encased in a yellow bird costume that looked like a Freddy Fazbear friend that Peyton remembered from her childhood. Interesting. <laughs> the bird had always been Peyton's favourite and for a moment she racked her brain to remember its name. Chica. That was it. Is that going to be the threat in this, in this story? Is Chica going to be the one chasing them down? She's suddenly going to come alive. Peyton smiled to see the Chica's costume familiar bib. Um, nearly printed with the words, let's eat, with the word pizza scribbled in marker below. <laughs> Good morning, young ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit Factory. The factory manager said, smiling. We like to think we make the best custom pizzas in the country and we're delighted to have you as our guests today. Now, first things first, everyone's going to have to, ha uh, have to wear a fashionable cap like the one I have on here. She posed like a model and then laughed. Molly let out a, l a loud groan and Mrs. Crutchfield shot her a look. I know they're not very glamorous, but it's a hygiene issue, Mrs. Bryant continued. Is it Miss Bryant or Mrs. Bryant? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many spelling mistakes. I'm so sorry. Oh, this is ridiculous. Um, nobody wants human hair as a pizza topping. Now there were more g groans, this time from disgust. Miss Bryant handed Mrs. Crutchfield a box. Mrs. Crutchfield, if you, would ha if you would pass out the caps, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, make sure all your hair gets tucked inside. Those of you with long hair need to be especially careful. This is already worse than I thought it would be, Marley said, holding her cap between her index finger and thumb, as if it were a dead rat. 
Peyton put on her cap and tucked her hair inside. I look like one of those old ladies who works in the school cafeteria, she said. She scrunched her face up into an old ladyish expression and said, You want some corn with that? <laughs> Marley shook her head. You are such a dork. She slapped the cap onto her head. My hair is going to be an ugly, sweaty mess by the time I get to take this thing off. Now, let me continue to have your attention, please, Miss Bryant said. There are a number of safety issues for touring the facility. Walk in a straight line and stay with your group at all times. There is to be no touching of any of the factory equipment under any circumstances. However, she smiled, each of you will be given a card and a pencil to carry with you as you tour the facility. Put your name on the card and check off the toppings you would like to have in your very own Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit. Each of your pizzas will be assembled and then delivered to you at your school tomorrow. She smiled wi widely. How cool is that? No one offered an opinion on how cool it was. Oh, and one other thing, Miss Bryant said. She sounded a little disappointed that people weren't acting more excited. As you enter the facility, make sure you grab some earplugs from James, who will be standing there by the door. It can get awfully loud in there. She looked around, trying to one more hopeful smile. Well, be safe and enjoy the tour. Shall we get started? Peyton was surprised at how loud the inside of the factory was, even with her earplugs in. She couldn't imagine what it must be like to work in that level of noise all day. Miss Bryant had to yell into a megaphone to make herself heard over the whirring and chugging of the machinery. The first area is where the dough is mixed. Workers in caps, pra pla eh, plastic gloves and white smocks dumped flour and yeast and water into giant canisters filled with enormous metal blades that mix the ingredients into a gooey, stretchy dough. And the next room is where it gets kind of hot. <laughs> My bedroom. No, I'm joking. Um, Miss Bryant said, leading them into a sauna-like room where huge vats of tomato sauce bubbled and steamed while being stirred by gigantic paddles. Even standing in the room for a minute made Peyton break out in a sweat, and she wondered how the workers could stand the heat all day. The bubbling vats reminded her of witches' cauldrons. This is gross, Marley whispered. It's so hot, I already feel like I need a shower. And now, if you'll follow me, you'll see where it, co where it all comes together, Miss Bryant said, motioning them forward. The assembly line, and here's where it gets really loud. The whirring, chugging, and pounding in the assembly room was almost too loud to bear. Mrs. Bryant pointed out where the dough was dropped into balls, then flattened into discs. The discs moved around uh, and forward on a conveyor belt and were then squirted with sauce. Next, the saucy dough was sprinkled with cheese. Next is what we call our topping bar, Miss Bryant said, gesturing toward huge clear cylinders labelled pepperoni, sausage, peppers, ground beef, meatballs, anchovies, mushrooms, onions, black olives, pineapple, bleh, no, 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 no pineapple, please, uh, artichoke, spinach, and eggplant. Here, let's take a break. Feel free to fill out the cards, choosing what toppings you want on your pizza kit. What would you guys have on your pizza, guys? Uh, honestly, uh, honestly, those, they, they don't sound like very good choices to me. <laughs> I don't like, I would probably have like sausage and... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm quite fussy. I don't know. I would at least have sausage. <laughs> Peyton checked pepperoni and mushrooms, not pineapple. Pineapple on pizza was an abomination. And did anybody really eat anchovies? An anchovy and pineapple pizza was the grossest combination she could imagine. If you're still undecided on what you want, hang on to your card. We'll collect the stranglers, the stranglers, the stragglers on the bus, Miss Bryant said. Next up is the pizza packaging center. Psst, Peyton, Marley muttered. What? Peyton said. She was actually enjoying the pizza tour more than she thought she would. Let's go up these stairs. Marley cocked her head in the direction of a set of metal stairs leading up to some kind of catwalk. It was the type of staircase that had holes in the stairs so you could look through them and see how high you were off the ground. Peyton didn't want to be reminded how far she was from the ground. She hated heights. I don't know, Peyton said. We're supposed to stay in line with the rest of the group. Come on, this tour is boring. Marley flashed her most charming smile. Let's explore, see what's up there. No, we better not, Peyton said. 
But she could see that Marley had, had that look that meant she wouldn't take no for an answer. Marley grabbed Peyton's hand and pulled her. Come on, we'll just go up for a minute and have a peek. Don't be such an old lady. You act as you're as ancient as Mrs. Crutchfield. Peyton didn't want to seem like Mrs. Crutchfield. She wanted to be young and have fun while she still could. She sighed. Okay, but just for a minute. Peyton followed Marley up the rickety seeming metal stairs trying not to look down at her feet. Steam from the vats of the production line was rising, making it look like they were walking into a cloud. They stood together on the narrow catwalk. Marley was energetic and laughing, but Peyton didn't like being there. The railings didn't see high enough to be safe, and a sign reading, Full warning, showed a stick man plummeting to his doom. It was unnerving. Can we go back down now? Peyton asked. As was always the case, when she was in a high place, her feet tingled and her stomach felt like it had, been mi it had migrated to the back of her throat. Not yet, Marley said. It's cool up here. All this steam makes it look like a horror movie where a monster comes out the fog and Marley lunged toward Peyton. Grabs you! Peyton felt like her heart was going to thud out of her chest. She took a deep breath and tried to get a hold of herself. Stop! You can't startle me like that! Not up here! Marley looked at her then grinned. Hey, you're really scared, aren't you? I don't like heights. Don't you remember how I wouldn't go on the ferris wheel with you at the fair? She had intended to go on the ride and had even stood in line with Marley but had chickened out at the last minute. That's right, you stayed on the ground and just waved at me, Marley said. Well, there's no reason to be scared up here. I'm sure this factory has safety regulations. I'm sure it's safe to run. She did a quick sprint down the catwalk, then ran back to where Peyton was standing. Or to jump up and down. As Marley jumped, Peyton could feel the catwalk give way a little. It made a horrible creaking sound. She grabbed onto the railing, afraid she might be sick. Marley, please stop. Marley laughed. Why should I stop? Because you're scared. I'm having an awesome time and I'm sure everything's super safe. She looked at a sign reading, don't lean on the railings. I bet that's even safe. She leaned her back against one railing and then propelled herself forward to lean into one of the opposite side of the walkway. The railing wasn't safe. Molly plunged forward and down, disappearing into the rising steam. Peyton screamed, but the sound was drowned out by the whirring and grinding of the machinery below. Her heart pounding. Peyton ran down the stairs to look for her friend. She looked for Marley's injured body on the floor, but she was nowhere in sight. Peyton looked at the steaming vats of sauce being constantly stirred by a giant metal paddle. How hot was that sauce? How deep was the vat? Could a person fall into it and... She struggled with even thinking of the word live. But that was what she was asking, wasn't it? Could a person fall into one of those vats and live? In her heart... She wanted to believe it was possible, but her brain told her differently. She approached the two nearest vats and tried to sort out the sounds they were making from all the other sounds in the factory. Was it her imagination? Or was one of them making a smooth sloshing sound while the other one sounded more like a slosh, thump, slosh, thump? She stood and listened for a moment until the thumping stopped. Maybe because it really did, or maybe because it had been her imagination in the first place. She didn't know where Marley was, but there was one thing she did know. If Marley had fallen into one of those vats, there was no way Peyton could get her out. Maybe if she told Mrs. Crutchfield, somebody would do something. But here, too, her brain and her, uh, her heart and her brain had told her something different. She wanted to believe that Marley could be okay. But the fact said otherwise. She had fallen from a great height. The vats of tomato sauce were boiling hot. Several minutes had passed since the accident, which meant it was probably too late. Molly could feel a distant ringing in her ears, and her vision narrowed to a pinprick. Her parents' endless binge-watching of true crime shows told her that she, was going to, that she was going into shock. Her mind whirled. What if she told Mrs. Crutchfield, but the old woman said that it was Peyton's fault for not, taking Marley, for not talking Molly down? Or what if, it, what if her, one of her classmates accused Peyton of pushing Marley in? Molly was beautiful and popular. It wouldn't be long before kids started to talk. Maybe they'd think Peyton was jealous and there had been no one to s there to see it beside Peyton herself. As if a switch had flipped on, Peyton felt herself going into self-preservation mode. It was too late to save Marley, but maybe she could at least save herself. Up ahead, the members of her class were heading toward the exit. If she just fell into line, maybe nobody would notice that she had wandered off for a few minutes. She took a deep breath and went to join her classmates. As they boarded the bus... What? <laughs> uh, 
As they boarded the bus, Mrs Crutchfield stood next to the door and checked students' names off her list. Peyton had a sinking feeling in the pit of her stomach. She walked past Mrs Crutchfield, boarded the bus, and took the same seat she had sat in on the way to the factory. It was glaringly obvious that the seat next to her was empty. After everybody else had taken their seats, Mrs Crutchfield tottered over toward Peyton with a concerned look on her face. Do you know where Marley is? Mrs Crutchfield asked, eyeing the empty seat. No, ma'am, Peyton said. It wasn't quite a lie. Marley could be in any one of the vats. <laughs> Peyton didn't know which one. <laughs> I don't think that's what she was asking. She wasn't asking which vat is she in. She was asking where in general is she. Oh, my God. Mrs Crutchfield's eyes narrowed. Weren't the two of you together on the tour? We were for a while, but then we got separated, Peyton said. Once again, not really a lie. They got separated when Peyton remained on the catwalk and Marley fell from it. Marley said she thought the tour was boring. Maybe she just bailed and walked home. Without telling her best friend? Mrs Crutchfield asked. Well, you know Marley, she's pretty independent. Mrs Crutchfield was silent for a moment. You have her phone number, I presume? Yes, I do, ma'am. Peyton couldn't tell if Mrs Crutchfield was really looking at her suspiciously or if she was just being paranoid. Mrs Crutchfield nodded. Call her, please. Peyton's hand shook as she took out her phone and pulled up Marley's name on her contacts list. The phone didn't ring on Marley's end, probably because it had been cooked in a vat of tomato sauce. Cook cooked in a vat of tomato sauce, like Marley. Peyton had to swallow hard to keep from being sick. No answer, she said. Mrs Crutchfield looked like she knew there was something Peyton wasn't telling her. Peyton figured Mrs Crutchfield had been teaching far too long not to know when a kid wasn't being honest. Finally, thankfully, Mrs Crutchfield broke eye contact. Well, I guess I'll have to alert her parents, she said. She turned and left Peyton. Oh, sorry, she turned and left. Peyton was relieved not to feel her penetrating stare anymore, but the relief didn't at last. One look at the empty seat beside her was all it took for her panic to return. When Peyton walked into the house, her mum was on the phone. Oh, here she is, she said. She held the phone out to Peyton. It's Marley's mum. She wants to talk to you. Peyton wanted to run, to go somewhere so far away that nobody could ask her any questions. But she held out her hand and took the phone. Hello, she said, her voice shaking. Peyton, when was the last time you saw Marley? Uh, she didn't come home? Peyton already felt like a liar. She knew Marley hadn't come home. If she had come home, I wouldn't be calling you. Marley's mom's voice broke into a sob. I'm sorry, that sounded rude. I'm just really upset. I know, me too. Marley's my best friend. Peyton wiped away a tear. She sat with me on the bus on the field trip. We got separated on the tour of the factory. Peyton winced as she said it, thinking of the moment they got separated, when Peyton st stayed standing on the catwalk and Marley fell, disappearing into the clouds of steam. She felt guilty talking to Marley's mum, but not guilty enough to tell the whole truth. Where was she when you last saw her? Peyton took a deep breath. Here comes the big lie, she thought. She was in line behind me when we were looking at the big containers of pizza toppings, but the next time I looked behind me, she was gone. She said she was bored, so I thought maybe she bailed. She'd done it before. You're right, that wouldn't be out of character for Marley, Marley's mum said. Listen, if you ever remember any detail, anything, any little thing that might help us find her, call me. I will, Peyton said. She hit end on the phone, sank into her arms, an armchair and sobbed. Her mum appeared with a box of tissues and a glass of ice water. Here, drink some water. It's easy to get dehydrated when you're upset. Marley accepted some tissues and the glass of water, but her throat was so choked up it was hard to swallow. So she was just there behind you and then she was gone? Mama asked. Peyton nodded. Her mum sat down on the couch. You don't think somebody could have taken her, do you? I don't think so, Peyton said. I mean, I didn't see anybody else around. I don't think so either. Not when I'm being rational anyway. It's just that you you see so much crazy stuff on the news nowadays, it's hard not to be paranoid, her mum said. Gina, Marley's mum, said they've already called the police, but Marley hasn't been gone long enough to be declared officially missing. I imagine the police will question everybody who works at the factory to make sure there weren't any creeps lurking around. Peyton hoped nobody at the factory would get in trouble over Marley's disappearance. She felt a tug at her conscience, telling her to come clean. 
but she had already lied so many to so many people today. Mrs. Crutchfield, Marley's mum, her own mum, that it was hard to imagine backtracking and telling the truth. If she was afraid of getting into trouble because she and Marley snuck off, it was nothing compared to the trouble she'd be in now. I think I'm still in shock, Peyton said. This statement, at least, was wholly true. But her mum reached out and patted her arm. Of course you are. I'm upset too. But you don't even like Marley. I don't dislike her. I just don't think she always makes the best choices, her mum said. And I'm devastated for Gina. This situation is every parent's worst nightmare. Peyton thought about the pain Marley's parents and little brother might be in. But would the pain be lessened if Peyton told the truth? At least if they had no clue about Marley, they could still hold out some hope. I think I need to go for a walk, try to clear my head a little, Peyton said. <sighs> oh, God. This this is like my worst nightmare as well. Um, it's, it's also the fact, like, this. I'm sure this has happened to everybody, where you start lying about something and then you can't stop lying, you know? Um, it's happened to me a few times, uh, and I'm very guilty of that. I don't want to be guilty of that, and I, and I want to lie about lying a lot, but I'll be honest, this has happened to me quite a few times, and it's devastating, and it really breaks you. Um, so I can feel, um, I can feel Peyton's pain here, but oh my god, <laughs> imagine being in this situation, what would you do? I guess you just have to tell the truth, right? You, you just have to. Otherwise, it's going to get worse and worse, and then the police are going to find out. And then, yeah, it's going to get even worse on there. Oh, my God. Where is this going to go? I don't know where this is going. Oh, my God. Okay. Her mum reached out, grabbed Peyton's hand, and squeezed it tight. Given what's happened with Marley, I'm kind of afraid to let you out of my sight. Peyton needed to get out of the house and have a few minutes in which she didn't have to think frantically about what to say and what not to say. I'm just going to walk around the block, mum. Like I do almost every day, her mum let go of her hand. Okay, but don't be gone long. As soon as Peyton was out the door, she took big gulps of fresh air to try to calm herself. Maybe Marley didn't really fall in the vat, she told herself. Maybe Marley was okay. Maybe she had fallen, then gotten right up and walked off and just hadn't made it back home yet. But deep down, Peyton knew Marley wasn't okay, even if she had missed one of the vats. You couldn't fall from a height like that and be okay. At best, you'd have multiple broken bones. At worst, Peyton took another deep breath. She knew what the worst case scenario was, and she was pretty sure it had been Marley's fate. Peyton walked around the block, taking deep breaths and trying to shake the tension out of her arms. She probably looked like a crazy person, but she didn't care. Maybe she was a crazy person, or maybe she was turning into one. At some point, if she kept on telling lie after lie, would she be unable to distinguish lies from the truth? True. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a very good quote right there. She stopped at the corner of Brook and Branch where she had met Marley the week before. It had been such a normal night. An ice cream cone, some whispering about boys, a walk to the duck pond. It all seemed so innocent and simple. It felt like those things had happened a lifetime ago. But that had been before and now it was after. Why is before in capital and after in capital? I'm so confused with what this book is, man. <laughs> there was no way to bring the time before back, so she kept on walking. She walked past the houses and yards, and she walked past every day. Everything looked the same, but it wasn't, and would never be again. Hey, Peyton, a voice called as she neared her house. Peyton looked in the direction of the voice. Abigail was sitting in the wicker chair on her porch with a book in her lap and a glass of lemonade on the table beside her. As always, her mousy brown hair was pulled back in a careless ponytail and her glasses had slipped down on her nose. She was wearing yoga pants and a t-shirt that said, Shh, I'm reading. She looked, uncom she looked so uh, comfortable but also lonely somehow. Hey Abigail. Usually Peyton just said hey and kept on walking. Today she stopped. What are you reading? Abigail looked a little surprised that Peyton was engaging her in conversation. Oh, it's just a mystery. It's about this girl who goes missing. It's pretty good. A missing girl. Great, Peyton thought. You know, I don't read much. Uh, I don't read as much as I used to, Peyton said. 
When Peyton and Abigail had been friends, they swapped books back and forth all the time. They had read together and talked about what they were reading. They had been a two-girl book club. But when the friendship with Marley started, there was so much real-life drama and intrigue that there had been no time for books. Maybe, Peyton said, you could recommend some good ones to me. I miss... I miss reading. She'd almost said, I miss you, but stopped herself. It was true, though. She did miss Abigail. She'd only just realised it. While the other girls knew Peyton... Uh, while the other girls Peyton knew had changed a lot when they started high school, worrying about makeup and clothes and what other people thought of them, Abigail seemed the same as she ever was. It was kind of nice. Say, Abigail set her book down on the table. Would you like a glass of lemonade? Suddenly, Peyton realised she was very thirsty. Yeah, a glass of lemonade would be great. Abigail stood. I'll be right back. She disappeared into the house. She came back with a tall, sweating glass. Jack, her fat Siamese cat, followed her out of the front door, rubbing against her legs. You can come up on the porch, she said. Thanks. Peyton climbed the steps to the porch and accepted the glass of lemonade from Abigail. Jack butted Peyton's legs with his head, and she bent down to pet him. You remember Jack, Abigail said. Of course I remember Jack, Peyton said, petting him under his chin. He's unforgettable. I remember when he was a tiny kitten, but he's a big boy now. A big fat boy, Abigail said. But he still thinks he's a tiny kitten. Would you like to sit down? The time they had spent apart was making their meetings strangely formal, like two people who had just met and were being careful not to offend each other. Sure, thanks. Peyton sat and sipped her lemonade. It was cold and tart and bracing the way she liked it. I'm sorry about Marley, Abigail said. You know about that? Peyton said. The high school gossip machine worked fast, apparently. It was all over school this afternoon, Abigail said. People said that when the bus came back from the home economics field trip, Marley wasn't on it. Yeah, Peyton said. It's weird. We were touring the factory and it was like she was just there and then she wasn't. She didn't want to lie to Abigail now that they had just started talking again. So she decided to stick to the statements that were technically the truth. Abigail nodded. You know, I've never really liked Marley, but I wouldn't want something bad to happen to her. And that's what people were saying, that something bad happened. This afternoon, somebody said that one of the kids on the field trip said they heard a scream. Peyton swallowed hard. Had Marley screamed as she fell? And if so, would it have been possible for someone to hear her over the noise of the factory's machinery? Everything that had happened surrounding the accident was such a blur. Peyton could remember rejoining the group, mindlessly filling out her pizza order card and turning it in, then sitting on the bus next to a conspicuously empty seat. The whole experience was as hazy in her mind as a dream. I want you to know, Abigail said, that even though I dislike Marley, I don't wish her ill. I genuinely hope she's okay. You're jealous of Marley, aren't you? Peyton asked. She realised, with some embarrassment, that she hadn't spent much time thinking about Abigail's feelings. Oh, do you think? Abigail sounded irritated. I was your best friend, and you ditched me to be best friends with her. How could I not be jealous? Peyton couldn't meet Abigail's eyes. I didn't really ditch you, we just grew apart. Well then, we grew apart very suddenly, so you could be Marley's best friend instead. You really hurt my feelings, Peyton. Peyton felt a sharp pain in her heart, like a bee had stung her there. I'm sorry. There was a long pause, and Abigail seemed to let out a breath she'd be holding in this whole time. It's okay, I forgive you. Thank you. Peyton was glad she could be forgiven of this, at least. And I hope Marley's okay, and I understand that she's your best friend now, but you know, sometimes maybe you and I could, you know, hang out. We're hanging out now, Peyton said, letting herself smile a little. Abigail smiled back. Yeah, but this is our first time hanging out since you ditched me, so it's super awkward. All the things Peyton liked about Abigail came flooding back to her in a rush. Her sense of humour, her intelligence, her honesty. She laughed. It is. It's so awkward. Peyton saw her mum walking down the sidewalk, a panicked look on her face. Mum, Peyton called. Hey mum, I'm over here. Peyton's mum put her hand to her chest and let out a sigh of relief. There you are. Good. I thought you'd just be gone for 20 minutes or so, but it's almost been an hour. I was worried about you because, well, you know, she didn't have to finish. I'm sorry, mum, Peyton said. I didn't mean to worry you. 
It's okay, her mum said, then looked at Abigail. Hi, Abigail. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too, Mrs. Thompson. You should come on home though, Peyton, her mum said. Dinner's almost ready. Peyton stood up. Okay. She turned to Abigail. Let's hang out soon. Definitely, Abigail said. And let me know if you hear anything about Marley. Peyton felt a stab of guilt that was becoming very familiar. I will. Peyton sat down at the dinner table with her mum and dad like she did every night. Tonight they were having roasted chicken with rice and broccoli, all of which she liked well enough. But when she put a chunk of chicken in her mouth and tried to chew it, it tasted like dust. She knew there was no way she could swallow it, so she spat it out into her napkin and hoped nobody noticed. I know it's been a tough day, honey, but you should try to eat your strength to eat to keep your strength up, her mum said. So much for nobody noticing. I can't, Peyton said, pushing away her plate. I mean, how can life go on as normal when something so bad has happened? How can people just go on eating dinner and doing homework and brushing their teeth and going to bed like everything's fine? It's a good question, her dad said, looking thoughtful. I guess people go on doing normal things because it's the only thing they can do. Just go on living and hope things get better, which they generally will over time. Peyton burst into tears. Things would never get better for Marley, and it would be a long, long time until things got better for Marley's parents and brother. But what if they don't? She said, sobbing. What if they never do? Peyton's mum and dad looked at each other the way they did when she asked a question they couldn't answer. Peyton didn't give them time to come up with anything. She knew they had no answers. No one did. She stood up. May I be excused, please? Sure, honey, her mum said. But later you're going to have to eat something before you go to bed. Mum's orders. Peyton climbed the stairs to her room, flopped down on her bed, and cried some more. Apparently, she carried an endless well of tears inside of her. She couldn't believe she hadn't run out of them by now. Today had been the hardest day of her life. The only tight bright spot was her talk with Abigail. She was glad the ice between them was thawing. She had forgotten how easy Abigail was to talk to, how natural things went between them. It was a different dynamic from Peyton's friendship with Marley. Peyton was always trying to impress Marley, to win her approval, so she was always a little on edge around her. She knew Abigail accepted her as she was, so when she was with Abigail, she could just be herself. Still, Peyton wished more than anything that she could see Marley again, that she could hear Marley laugh and call her a dork because of some stupid joke she had made. After a long cry, Peyton took out her homework and tried to get started on it, but it was useless. What was the point of doing homework when people you loved could just disappear in the blink of an eye? Making an effort of any kind seemed pointless. There was a light knock on the door. Can I come in? Her mum asked. I guess so. Peyton mumbled into her pillow. Her mum was carrying a tray from which sweet and spicy smells emanated. Hey, I made you some hot chocolate and cinnamon toast. I figured you might be able to eat it when you couldn't eat anything else. Cinnamon toast and hot chocolate had always been Peyton's go-to comfort food when she was sick or sad. Her mum had been making it for her since she was a toddler. Peyton sat up in bed. Thanks. Her mother's kindness made her cry a little more especially when she thought about how she was lying to her mum about Marley. You're welcome. Her mum handed Peyton a saucer holding the slice of cinnamon toast and set the mug of hot chocolate on the bedside table. I think I'd like to be left alone now, if that's okay, Peyton said. Looking at her mum's face made her feel too guilty. Not until I've seen you eat at least half that cinnamon toast, her mum said, sitting down on the foot of the bed. Okay. Peyton nibbled the cinnamon toast and took a sip of hot chocolate. It was strange how these things could still taste good even when life was so bad. I've never had anything happen to me like what happened to you today, her mum said. It's hard when you're the parent and you can't think of anything to say to make your kid feel better. Her mum looked like she was in a danger of crying herself. I guess all I can say is that your dad and I are here when you need us. Peyton nodded, too full of emotion to speak. Now, were you able to do your homework? her mum asked. Peyton shook her head. How about I write your teachers a note? They'll know what happened and they know Marley is your best friend. I bet they'll let you turn it in on Monday and who knows, by then Marley might be back home safe and sound. She patted Peyton's leg and got up from the bed. Thanks mum, Peyton said, even as she knew Marley was neither safe nor sound. Peyton brushed her teeth, climbed into bed and curled up in a little ball. 
she was sure she wouldn't be able to sleep, but the exhaustion of the day had been too much for her, and she lost consciousness as though she had experienced a physical trauma, not just an emotional one. She was surrounded by the whirring and churning of machinery. She looked around and saw she was in Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit factory. She was alone. She had gotten separated from her group, and she needed to find them. She entered a dimly lit room, where vats of tomato sauce gurgled as they bubbled and boiled. She looked around frantically for any sign of her classmates or teacher. There was no one. On the floor in front of the vats was a big black pot, like a witch's cauldron. It was hanging over an open fire that had been built with some logs. An open fire inside a building, Peyton thought. How is that even safe? A familiar figure from Peyton's early childhood walked out and took his place behind the cauldron. It was a big, furry Freddy Fazbear with his tiny top hat and familiar grin. Freddy was carrying a big burlap bag, the kind that Christmas cards always showed Santa carrying. Humming to himself, Freddy reached into his bag and pulled out a long-handled wooden spoon. He dipped the spoon into the cauldron of sauce and then stirred. He dipped up a spoonful of sauce, sniffed it, then tasted it thoroughly. Or thoroughly? Thoughtfully. <laughs> Freddy reached back into his bag and pulled out a human arm, pale and thin. He dropped it into the pot of sauce and stirred. He dipped into the bag and pulled out a foot next, a girl's foot, small with the toenails painted baby pink. He dropped it too, into the bubbling cauldron. Horror was building in Peyton. Horror, but also comprehension. She was terrified of what he was going to pull out next, but she couldn't look away. Freddy reached into the bag one more time and retrieved a severed head that he held by its luxurious blonde hair. At first, Peyton couldn't see the face, but as Freddy turned the head around, she saw it was Marley, her eyes wide and unseeing, her mouth open in a silent scream. Oh my god! That is brilliant writing! That's so good! Oh, that makes up for all the spelling mistakes. Now, let me just, give me a second, because this is an amazing part. But that, those two words, silent scream, is so spine-chilling to me, because it's, what is it, a juxtaposition? I think it's a juxtaposition, because you can't have a silent scream, because screams are really loud, and silence is quiet, obviously, and so it's a juxtaposed uh, thingy. But that sentence is mad. Oh my god. Freddy let go of the hair, and the head landed in the cauldron of, of sauce with a splash. This is amazing. Peyton woke up, gasping for breath. There would be no more sleeping tonight. I heard she ran away, one girl said to another standing in front of the lockers. I heard she ran off with Sean Anderson, the other girl, girl said. But that can't be right, because Sean's at school today. I heard she ran off to New York City to be a model, a girl who had been listening on the conversation weighed in. The gossip buzzed in Peyton's ears. Her head felt like a hive of angry bees. She sat in her math class, but she couldn't concentrate. A voice came on over the intercom. Peyton Thompson, please report to the front office. Peyton felt a knot of fear form in her stomach. Whatever this is, it can't be good. Like a prisoner awaiting her sentence, she rose from her desk and walked to the office, consumed with dread. When she reached the office, she wasn't comforted by the sight of a police officer standing by the front desk with her mum right beside him. Peyton's mind buzzed with panicked questions. Did the police know she was lying? Had they told her mum? Could a person get arrested for lying? Hey, her mum said. Peyton could tell she was trying to sound casual, but the tone of her voice was strained and her brow was wrinkled like it got when she was worried or upset. Officer Jacobs wants to ask you a few questions since you've been the last you seem to be the last person who saw Marley. Peyton shifted from foot to foot. She couldn't meet her mum's eyes, let alone the police officers. I don't know if I was the last person who saw her. Well the other kids all seemed to have lost track of her in the factory sooner than you did, her mum said, her voice getting shakier with every word. And apparently nobody working in the factory says they saw a girl who got separated from the field trip group. I won't take up much of your time, and then you can get back to class, Officer Jacob said. He was a large, bald man with a gentle face. Under other circumstances, Peyton wouldn't have been scared of him. Officer Jacobs looked over at the secretary behind the front desk. Ma'am, is there some place private we could sit down and talk? The, sec the secretary stood up. Of course, let me show you to this conference room. Peyton sat in the small room beside her mum and across from Officer Jacobs. 
She felt like she was on one of those crime dramas her mom watched all the time. She wondered if her mom found this kind of drama less entertaining when it was in real life. So you rode the bus with Marley on the field trip? The officer asked, his pen poised above the notepad. Yes, sir, Peyton said. She felt sweaty and wondered if it was noticeable. We rode together on the way to the factory. Officer Jacobs nodded. And then you were together for the tour? For part of it, yes. But it was like we were together and then we weren't. It's not a lie, Peyton told herself. Officer Jacobs wrote something down. And where were you in the process of touring the factory when you noticed Maya was missing? Peyton started to sweat more profusely. What had she told her parents when they had asked her a question? The containers of pizza toppings. She was pretty sure she had told them they'd been near the containers of pizza toppings. Uh, okay. She's going to mix up lies and, that, and that's, that's what's going to be the breaking point. Um, previous to this experience, Peyton had not been in the habit of telling lies. She was discovering how hard it was. Once you came up with a story, you had to stick with it regardless of whom you were talking to. Exactly. It wasn't easy to remember the details and use them consistently. Um, we were near the containers of pizza toppings, I think, Peyton said. That was when you noticed she wasn't there, the officer said. Yes, sir. I turned around and she was gone. Uh, hang on. He, he should pick up on the fact that she didn't tell a teacher or anything that, that she was missing. And, and the teacher just found out by herself. Right? So, uh, I don't know. I don't know. The officer jotted something else down on his notepad. Peyton wished she could see what it, he was writing. She feared it was the word liar. The officer looked up from his notepad. Had she said anything to you about leaving or maybe about any about having plans to meet someone later? No, sir. Peyton reconsidered. Well, she didn't say anything about meeting anybody or anything like that, but she did say that the tour was lame and a waste of time. So I figured maybe she just left. The officer raised an eyebrow. Without saying goodbye to her best friend? Well, that's not what Marley's like. She does what she wants when she wants. If she got bored and decided she was going to go, she would have just gone. She's done it before. The officer jotted something else down. Well, thank you for your time. We'll be in touch if we need to ask you anything else. We're working very hard to find your friend. Okay, that's good, Peyton said, but she knew it didn't sound like the right thing to say. It was hard to sound hopeful about their efforts when she knew good and well that there was no chance that they were going to find Marley alive. Can I go back to class now? The officer nodded. As they left the conference room, Peyton's mum put her arm around her shoulders. I know that was hard. I'm proud of you. Are you going to be okay for the rest of the day? Peyton nodded, but tears sprang to her eyes. She knew her mum wouldn't be proud of her if she knew the truth. Oh my god. This is hard. <laughs> It'll be okay, her mum said, giving her a little squeeze. I just have a feeling you're going to see be seeing your friend uh, again real soon. In a home economics class, oh no, this is where they get the pizza boxes, and it's going to be Marley in, in, in it or something. I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know what to expect. Ah! In a home economics class, Mrs. Crutchfield stood next to a table stacked high with pizza boxes. As you can see, our Freddy Fazbear pizza kits have been delivered, she said, looking around at the class. Each pizza box has a student's name on it. When I call your name, come get your pizza kit. In order to save time, I took the liberty of preheating all the ovens to 425 degrees. 425? Oh, of course, that's Fahrenheit, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, 425 Celsius? Um... Bake your pizza for 12 to 14 minutes, according to the directions on the box, and then bon appetit. She picked up the pizza box and said, Emma? Emma came to claim her pizza kit, and Mrs. Crutchfield continued calling the students' names. One by one, the girls shuffled to the front of the room to get their pizza creations. When a girl named Hannah came up to get hers, she asked, Mrs. Crutchfield, is there a pizza kit with Marley's name on it? No, dear, I'm afraid not, Mrs. Crutchfield said not meeting Hannah's eyes. Sadly, Marley disappeared before she could choose the ingredients for her pizza kit. But the police are looking for her and I'm sure they'll find her safe and sound. Despite the reassuring words, Mrs. Crutchfield's tone did not sound confident. She picked up another pizza box. Peyton? She called. Peyton got up from her seat next to the one Marley used to occupy. She, she walked to the front of the room and claimed her pizza kit. The box was white with red letters, spelling out Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit, with a picture of Freddy smiling the same way he had in Peyton's dream the night before. The box was soggy on the bottom, and when she pulled her hand away, it was red, with what she hoped was with all her heart was tomato sauce. 
Of course it's tomato sauce, she told herself. What else could it be? Tomato sauce. She thought of the big, steaming vat of tomato sauce where Marley had, in all likelihood, met her doom. Which would happen first if you fell into a vat like that? Would you drown or be boiled alive? Or would you be beaten to death by the giant, always turning paddles that stirred the sauce? She lifted her fingers to her nose and sniffed them to make sure the red liquid had tomato sauce's familiar tang. The smell of blood also had a tang. Stop it, Peyton told herself. You're freaking out. If people see you freak out, they'll get suspicious. They'll know. Peyton, are you alright? Mrs. Crutchfield's voice penetrated Peyton's racing mind. What? Oh, yes, Mrs. Crutchfield. Then please take your seat until the other girls have picked up their pizza kits. Yes, ma'am. Peyton quickly sat down. She had no idea how long she'd be standing at the front of the classroom, lost in her panicky thoughts. All around, her classmates were opening their pizza kits, ooing and ahhing over them as if they were presents on Christmas morning. Their comments all blurred together in Peyton's confused, frightened brain. Hey, this looks pretty good. Looks way better than the mystery nuggets the nuggets the cafeteria is serving for lunch today. Sausage and mushroom with extra cheese, my favourite. They weren't stingy with the extra cheese either. <laughs> with shaking hands, Peyton opened her own pizza kit. She looked down at the box's contents. Something about it didn't feel right. Red liquid pooled in the bottom of the box. The crust was not the usual pale colour of dough, but closer to the colour of a bandaged approximations of Caucasian skin. Oh my god! With one trembling finger, she reached out and touched one of the pepperoni slices. It was soft and smooth. That's not usually how pepperoni usually felt, was it? She thought of the game played in the dark at Halloween parties where you passed around the peeled grapes and said, These are the dead man's eyes. Then the cold spaghetti noodles. These are the dead man's guts. Peyton felt her stomach roll with nausea and her mouth fill with saliva. She couldn't be sick. If she got sick, it would call attention to her and make people think she knew more than she was saying. She swallowed hard, fighting her body's stronger urge to vomit. She would not be sick. She would not call attention to herself. She would bake her pizza and eat it just like everybody else. The thought of eating the pizza filled her with a disgust, more intense than any feeling she had ever known in her life. But she was going to do it. She had to do it. Oh no, she's a cannibalist. <laughs> in the kitchen area, she took the soggy, dripping pizza from the box and slid it into the oven next to the other girl's pizzas. Drops of red liquid fell from her pizza and splattered onto the clean white floor. Whoa, Peyton, you went a little heavy on the red sauce, didn't you? Hannah said. <laughs> Peyton forced a smile and shrugged. What can I say? It's my favourite part. She grabbed a paper towel and wiped up the mess. The other girls waited happily for their pizzas, talking about how they were starving and couldn't wait to eat them. Peyton waited with a growing sense of dread. She hoped desperately that someone would pull a fire alarm, and by the time they returned to the classroom, the pizzas would be burnt and inedible. Or maybe she could drop hers on the floor so she wouldn't have to eat it. No. Dropping it would make everybody look closely at her and closely at the pizza. They knew, they would know there was something wrong with her and something wrong with it. When the bell on the oven timer rang, Peyton jumped like a bomb had exploded. There was no avoiding it. It was pizza time. As Mrs. Crutchfield had said it, bon appetit. <laughs> with shaking hands, Peyton took her pizza out of the oven. Oven. She took out the pizza cutter and held it over the hot pie, feeling like she was wielding a deadly weapon. The sound of the sharp metal wheel slicing through the cheese and cheese and sauce and separating the crust into quarters was like a machete slicing through flesh. All around her, girls exclaimed over their pizzas. It smells so good! I want to take a bite right now, but I don't want to burn my mouth. The cheese is so gooey and stretchy. Peyton picked up her pizza and carried it to her table. She sat down and stared at it. The sauce was blood red. She poked the dough with her finger. It was soft and somehow fleshy. The pepperoni reminded her of a tongue. Oh my god! <laughs> the girls at the other tables were gobbling their pizza slices, laughing and having a great time. Peyton stared down at the unappetizing pizza. The pizza was evidence of how she had abandoned Marley, abandoned her and then lied about it. Peyton had no choice. She had to destroy the evidence. She had to eat it. <sighs> she swallowed hard to force down the lump that had formed in her throat. 
She picked up the first slice and took a tiny nibble from the tip of the triangle. It tasted salty and greasy and metallic and wrong somehow. The texture of the dough was different than any pizza she had ever eaten before. Fatty. Grisly. How could dough be grisly? She chewed and chewed, but somehow the food didn't seem to be breaking down the way it should. It almost seemed like it was growing bigger in her mouth instead of smaller. With great effort, she forced herself to swallow and felt the solid doughy ball work its way with difficulty down her esophagus toward her stomach. She was reminded of a nature document she saw once that showed a large boa constrictor eating a rat hole. You could see the shape of the unfortunate rodent as the snake's muscles forced it down its throat and into its belly. Jesus Christ! <laughs> The difference was that this snake appeared to be enjoying the rat way more than she was enjoying this pizza. But there was no choice. She had to take another bite. And another. Each one was worse than the one before. <clears throat> now that it was cooked, the pepperoni had the texture of peeling sunburnt skin, and the sauce had a coppery tang like once when P Peyton had cut her finger and stuck it in her mouth. She couldn't let thoughts like this flood her mind. Not if she was going to finish this pizza. She tried to take bigger bites to make it go faster, but it soon became apparent that this wasn't a good idea. The big chunks landed in her stomach, as heavy as rocks, and when she looked at the pizza on her plate, it didn't look significantly smaller. One slice. Most of the other girls had finished their pizzas and were washing their plates at the kitchen station, chatting and laughing. Peyton had only made it through one slice. Eating this pizza was like swallowing stones. Are you alright, Peyton? Peyton looked up to see Mrs. Crutchfield standing beside her table, looking at her with a concerned expression. I beg your pardon, Peyton said. It was hard to talk. The last bite she took of the pizza was still hung in her throat. I was asking if you were all right, Mrs. Crutchfield said. You look pale. I'm fine, Peyton said, though of course she wasn't. Mrs. Crutchfield looked down at Peyton's mostly uneaten pizza. Do you not like what you made? Oh, I like it. It's just very... filling. Mrs. Crutchfield looked at her for a moment. I know it must be hard on you with Marley missing, but I'm sure she'll turn up soon. She's right here, Peyton thought. Right here on my plate. For a second, she thought she might actually laugh. She feared she was losing her mind, but she nodded and said, Thank you, ma'am. I hope so. Peyton was forcing down the last bite of pizza when the bell rang to change classes. She felt ill and bloated as if the dough were expanding in her stomach, as if it might keep on expanding and expanding until she burst like a blood-filled tick. She suffered through the last class of her day, her stomach churning, and then suffered even more on the bus ride home, as every bump and pothole the bus drove over made the um, unstable contents of her stomach threaten to evacuate the premises. She stumbled through the front door of the house. Hey, hon, her mum called from the kitchen. Any word on Marley? Peyton could barely get the word at, get out the word no. Her mum appeared in the living room and looked at her with a knitted brow. Are you okay, sweetie? You don't look so good. Oh my god, you know what's gonna happen? She's gonna be sick and it's gonna be and Marley's just gonna come out of her stomach or whatever. Sick, Peyton managed to get out with a great effort. Something I ate. Oh, that's too bad, mum said. And I'm sure worrying about Marley isn't helping any. I hope you feel better by dinner time. I'm making pot roast, your favourite. Her mum's pot roast usually was her favourite, but now the thought of it sickened her. The stringy meat stewed in its own fat and juices. Even the carrots and onions and potatoes were saturated in the juices of dead cow. First came death, then the butchering, then the cooking and eating of the flesh. Peyton feared that the Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit had been her last experience eating the meat of another creature. From now on, assuming she could ever bring herself to eat anything again, she would be a vegetarian. Peyton remembered a vegetarian kid in middle school who used to wear a t-shirt with pictures of animals on it that said, don't eat your friends. <laughs> After today, these words had taken on a new meaning. Maybe you should take an antacid and go lie down, her mum said. Peyton nodded and dragged herself up the stairs to her room. She didn't take an antacid um, because she didn't think she could swallow anything and keep it down, not even medicine. She curled up on her bed and moaned softly in misery, drifting in and out of consciousness. Peyton's stomach churned. She had experienced indigestion and stomach viruses in the past, but never had her digestive system made this much noise. It rumbled, then sloshed, then gurgled so loudly that if anybody had been in the room with her, they would have heard it and asked what was wrong. Maybe lying curled up on her side wasn't the best choice, she thought. Maybe it was better to stretch out so her stomach wouldn't be so smooshed. 
She lay on her back, a wave of nausea washed over her, followed by sharp, almost unbearable pangs. Without really meaning to, she put her hands on her stomach. Something from inside her body bumped up against her palms like it was trying to push its way out. What was it? It was horrible. Peyton lifted her shirt so she could see her belly, usually flat. Now it was expanding and contracting in a way she wasn't controlling. It felt like something she was beating. Uh, it, was so, it felt like something was beating her up from the inside, punching her stomach so hard it was going to leave bruises. This was not a normal stomach ache. There was something inside her, something other than disgusting pizza she had barely choked down in home economics class. Peyton had once watched a gross TV show about how pe about people infested with parasites. There had been a woman on the show who had had a giant tapeworm living in her stomach. The woman ate and ate, but kept getting thinner because the tapeworm devoured everything she consumed. Finally, the woman learned that sometimes if you left a piece of food on your tongue, the tapeworm would crawl up to get to, to get it, and then it would be pulled out of your body. The woman had, a, had set a piece of raw steak on her stomach, and the tapeworm had crawled out of her stomach, up her esophagus, and into her mouth. When she pulled it out, it was eight feet long. I hate tapeworms. Um... Peyton remembered that this woman had kept the deceased tapeworm in a jar on her mantle, which did not strike Peyton as a sound decorating choice. When she was thinking clearly, it really made no sense for her to believe that the pizza she had eaten had contained pieces of barley. However, wasn't it possible that she had swallowed a worm? People ingested parasites all the time. If they didn't, why would there be a TV show about it? Maybe that was what had made her so sick, she wondered. If she put a piece of food on her tongue, would whatever was inside her crawl up to get it? Her stomach churned harder and faster, her belly expanded, swelling like a balloon. She could feel her skin stretch to its limit. Her body was definitely trying to expel something. It was time to take action. Peyton tiptoed downstairs. The TV was blaring one of her, fi one of her parents' crime shows, so she figured she could sneak into the kitchen undetected. She opened the refrigerated door and tried to decide on the best bait for luring a worm. There was no raw steak, but there was raw hamburger. She liked her burgers well done, so her stomach churned even harder as she thought of holding the cold, bloody beef on her tongue. Still, if doing so got rid of whatever was causing her such misery, it was worth the ick factor. It was amazing what a person was willing to do if they were desperate. She pinched off a piece of the meat rolled it into a small ball, harmed it, and headed back upstairs. Are you okay, Peyton? Her mum called from the living room. Yeah, I just got some ginger ale to settle my stomach, she called, trying to stand as normal as possible. Good idea, her mum said. Let me know if you need anything, okay? Peyton didn't know if what she was about to do was really a good idea, but she had to do something. She sat down on the bed and placed the ball of raw ground beef on her tongue. It was clammy with the metallic taste of blood. As her body temperature warmed the clump of meat, it started to secrete its juices, the blood and grease running down her throat. She didn't want to swallow it, but she didn't want it back in her mouth either. She gagged violently, and bitter saliva combined with the meat juices in her mouth, filling it, um, yeah, filling it with a sickening mixture of fluids. She jumped up and ran to the bathroom, knowing that uh, at the very least she was going to throw up. But maybe that was all she needed to do, she told herself. Throwing up was awful, but sometimes, when something made you so sick and you threw up, you felt better afterward. Maybe that's all that would happen, she told herself, but she knew she was telling herself a lie. She winced at the reflection in the bathroom mirror. She was pale and sweaty. Her skin had a strange greyish cast, and there were dark half-moons under her eyes. She could never remember looking this bad. Maybe this illness was too serious to take care of at home. Maybe she should tell her mum she needed to go to the hospital to have her stomach pumped. But if she told her mum about the pizza kit, would she also have to tell her she knew what happened to Marley? Would she have to admit that she had lied to a police officer? She was afraid that if she started talking, she wouldn't be able to stop and all her secrets would spill out. She couldn't take the risk of getting into that much trouble, so she waited. She opened her mouth wide, looking in the mirror, waiting for whatever it was to appear. She could see past her tongue to her uvula and into the dark tunnel of her throat. Holding her mouth open made the urge to gag stronger, especially as now tepid, uh, as the now tepid raw meat continued to ooze. The meat's greasy fluids pooled underneath her tongue. It was repulsive. 
She couldn't stop thinking about what she was holding in her mouth was a chunk of mut mutilated dead cow. If she made it through this experience, she was definitely becoming a vegetarian. The wait was excruciating. How long had it been? Minutes? Hours? It felt like it had been years and years. There was a slight movement in her abdomen. Was it the worm, or whatever it was, sensing the ground beef, sniffing it, if worms could smell, and starting to make its way toward it? But then it was still again. Had she only imagined it? She waited some more, sticky saliva pooling in her mouth. She desperately wanted to spit the meat into the sink, but she knew it was her best chance of solving the problem on her own. And then she felt it. Something was moving in her stomach. It felt like it was in uncoiling like a snake. She could feel the worm, if that's what, what it was, uh, pushing herself out of its stomach, pushing itself out of her stomach, sorry, and up her esophagus. But it was a different sensation than throwing up. The thing making its way up her torso was solid and slow. And then she was choking, coughing and retching. She looked in the mirror. Her throat was visibly pulsing as the thing inside her moved up the le length of her neck. I feel faint. <laughs> I feel so lightheaded right now. The words better out than in popped into her head. But in this case, she couldn't be sure that they were true. She didn't want the thing to stay inside her, but she was also afraid to see it. Her mouth popped open extra wide, like when the dentist pried it apart to, fill, fit in its, to fit in his tools. She looked at her gaping mouth in the mirror. She felt something wriggly against her palate. palate. I don't know what a palate is. <laughs> she leaned closer to the mirror to see better, then blinked to and shook her head because she couldn't believe what she saw. Fingers! Oh no! Oh! Oh! Moving fingers with petal pink polish. Marley's colour, by the way, this is good, good uh, alliteration. Marley's colour on the nails. The fingers were attached to a hand that she could see emerging from her stretched out throat. No, 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 no. She couldn't let whatever that hand was attached to come out where she could see it. She reached in her mouth, grabbed the hand, and tried to shove it back into her esophagus. She swallowed as she shoved, trying to force it down, but the hand was too large, and it kept moving, kept pushing her hand away like it was fighting her. Peyton gra gagged. Her body was trying to force out the very thing she was trying to force back in. She doubled over, heavy, uh, uh, sorry, heaving and sputtering. When she stood back up, her mouth stretched open so wide that her lips cracked and bled. <gasps> oh my god! The hand shot out of her mouth, its fingers blindly reaching and grabbing. In the mirror, Peyton saw herself, her jaws wrenched open like a snake swallowing a whole rat, except it was a girl's hand and wrist, not a rat's tail, then protruded from her face. Her airway blocked by the emerging arm, Peyton wanted to breathe. She wanted to scream. Oh my god, certain she was going to suffocate if she didn't get help. She took a shaky step toward the bathroom door, so fast that she couldn't even process it. The hand re retreated back into her mouth and down her throat, into her body cavity. Peyton sucked in huge gasps of air and sank into a sitting position on the bathroom floor, too drained to make it back to her be bedroom. She leaned against the white tile wall and spat the raw meat ball into a wad of toilet paper. She used the bath towel to wipe the cold sweat from her face. She tried to process what had just happened. It definitely wasn't a worm that was inside her. There was no doubt in her mind that the hand that had shot out of her mouth was Marley's. She and Marley had done each other's nails at sleepovers. She knew her best friend's hand when she saw it. Her best friend. Marley was her best friend and she hadn't told anybody about her incident because she was afraid of getting in trouble. Maybe if she had told someone, Mrs Crutchfield, one of the factory workers, they could have found Marley in time to save her. And even if it had been too late, at least that way Marley's parents would have known what happened to her. They, c they wouldn't still be waiting and worrying. <clears throat> but was Marley still alive? It had been her hand and it was moving. But she couldn't be alive and inside Peyton, could she? Peyton shook her head hard, as if doing so might reset her scrambled brain. Maybe she was having some kind of emotional breakdown. Maybe everything that had seemed so real was just in her imagination. Maybe the guilt of betraying Marley had destroyed her emotional health. Uh, the thought that none of this was real felt strangely comforting. She decided she would go to bed, get some sleep, and in the morning she would tell her mum that she was having a hard time dealing with Marley being missing and that maybe she should see a doctor. Peyton took several, step, uh, several deep breaths and stood up. 
The awful meaty taste was still in her mouth. She needed to brush her teeth. She squeezed the paste onto her toothbrush and regarded herself in the mirror. She still looked pale and exhausted, but she wasn't sweaty and feverish looking like she had been before. She brushed her teeth and tongue, scrubbing away at the taste of blood and animal fat. She rinsed with water, then swished some minty mouthwash for good measure. That was better. She was going to get better. She just needed to ask for some help. She splashed her face with warm water and started to dry it off. As she rubbed the towel against her throat, she felt something l jump inside her neck. She looked in the mirror. Lumps were rising beneath the skin of her throat, moving around and rearranging themselves. Her skin is stretched and her veins bulged. No, Peyton thought. This isn't real. This isn't real because what I thought happened before wasn't real either. But the image in her mirror told a different story. Peyton put both hands on her throat to make sure she was seeing that what she was seeing wasn't an illusion. Some of the lumps were the size of grapes, others were nearly the size of golf balls. They moved under her fingers when she pressed on them, darting like they were trying to avoid her touch. She felt some kind of solid matter making its way up her throat, making it hard to breathe and impossible to yell for her parents, for someone to do something. She felt so alone, except she wasn't alone because of the intruding presence inside of her. She looked back at the mirror. Now there were lumps on her face too, large ones, moving around, distorting her, her features, straining the taut skin until it threatened to split. Her eyes bulged. Something was pushing hard beside behind them. She had never felt such intense pressure. Her eyes protruded out from her eyelids, opening so wide that she could see the orbs in their entirety. The whites, the dilated pupils, the bursting blood vessels. Pulpy red slop seeped then spewed from her eye socket so forcefully that her eyeballs were propelled from her face like cannonballs blasting from a cannon. What? <laughs> one hit the mirror with a wet slap while the other one landed with a splat in the basin of the sink. Pressed together into a soft, solid mass, the bits of flesh and tissue squeezed from Peyton's empty eye sockets like fresh sausage being extruded, extruded from a meat grinder. What is this? What is this? The slop fell to the floor in long tubes. She could see nothing, but she could feel the pressure in her head building even more as it became fuller and fuller until she feared it might explode. The meaty remains of Peyton's best friend poured from her mouth and sprayed out of her nostrils in a sneeze that splattered the red compressed innards in onto the white bathroom tiles. Oh my god, I feel so lightheaded right now. Still, the pressure in her head grew throbbing like a huge hammer was pounding her skull from the inside. It was a strange sort of relief when the fleshy paste started squeezing out of her ears too. The pressure reduced, leaving Peyton so lightheaded she couldn't stand. She had never fainted, but she feared she might, unseeing, unhearing, unable to make any sound except a soft whimper in the back of her clogged throat. She collapsed to her knees on the bathroom floor. She fell into a mound of body temperature meat mush. Her fingers groped through silvers of skin, gobbets of organs, fragments of bone, all that was left of the friend she had turned her back on. Peyton couldn't scream, couldn't cry, but in between bouts, or boot, I don't know what that means, bouts of spewing out more crushed human remains, she did manage to whisper one name, Molly. Peyton sat up in bed with a start, stifling a scream, her stomach voiled, and her diaphragm spasmed, <laughs> her mouth filled with bitter saliva. There was no way to hold it back anymore. She was finally going to lose her lunch, violently. She jumped out of bed and ran. She stopped at the bathroom door for a second, but then kept running. For some reason, she didn't want what was going, uh, she didn't want what was going to come out of her to be inside the house, not even if she flushed it down the toilet. The remains of the pizza that churned inside her felt polluting, contaminating. She wanted it gone. She ran downstairs and out the front door. Once she was out on the porch, she took deep breaths of fresh air in hopes that it would ease her nausea. No such luck. She ran to the edge of the porch and retched into the bushes. Peyton had never vomited so violently or for so long. Clutching the stair railing to hold herself up, she spewed and spewed until she feared she would soon be vomiting up her own internal organs. How much longer is this going to go on for? Surely, she thought, there could be nothing left inside her. But then another wave would hit her and there would be more. Finally, there came several minutes of dry heaving. 
At last, she was empty. She tiptoed back into the house and locked the front door behind her. Her goal was to get back in bed without her parents noticing she had gone out. She was not in the mood to answer anybody's questions. All she wanted was to be left alone and to leave the terrible experiences of this day behind her. Lying back down, she felt marginally better. She was weak and sweaty and shaky, but at least her stomach wasn't tossing like a ship in a stormy sea. And emotionally, there was something cleansing about the nightmare pizza having been <laughs> purged from a system. Next animatronic nightmare pizza. It felt like a fresh start somehow. Peyton closed her eyes, hoping she could sleep the night through. Wait, didn't our eyeballs, like, pop out? Or was that fake? Oh, oh I, I must have lost track now. <laughs> I was... I, I was, yeah, I was going crazy over the eyeballs popping out. But there was a noise. It was a rustling noise coming from outside in the vicinity of the bushes where Peyton had emptied herself of the vile pizza. Oh, right, yeah, she just emptied herself rather than... Okay, no, that makes more sense. <laughs> it's probably just squirrels or one of the neighbourhood cats, Peyton thought. It would stop soon. The rustling didn't stop. Instead, it got louder, making it impossible for Peyton to sleep. She got out of bed, went to a window and opened it. The sound was definitely coming from the bushes where she had been sick. But wait, what if it was Marley? After this thought, the horrible what-ifs began to unspool in her brain. What if Marley wasn't coming back to joyously greet her friend? What if Marley was mad at her for not trying to save her, for not telling anyone, not even the police officer, that she had seen Marley fall? Peyton knew from the experience that Marley had a temper and held grudges against people when she thought they had wronged her. What if Marley was out for revenge? Another even more horrific thought spread like a stain in Peyton's head. What if Marley had fallen into the vat of boiling sauce and died, but had somehow managed to come back like in the dream she had just had, if it even had been a dream? What if what was outside was not really Marley, but somehow what was left of Marley? The doorbell rang. That's such a good short, short sentence. Peyton's heart pounded in panic. <laughs> the, the, they're really going for alliteration in the story. It's really working. Uh, Peyton's heart pounded in panic. She had to get away, but how? Unable to think of another choice, she opened the window and climbed out onto the ivy-covered lattice on the side of the house. One piece of wood shattered under her bare foot. The lattice clearly wasn't strong enough to support her for long. Still, she clung to it with a white knuckled grip. She had climbed out of the window with a thought of shimmying down the side of the house and running away, but now she realised that she was that going down the lattice would put her right next to the front porch, right next to Marley. There was no place to go but up. The lattice shook and squeaked as she climbed toward the roof. She grabbed the gutter and pulled herself up. She was so terrified she could hardly breathe, but even though she was afraid of heights, she was even more afraid of what was standing on her porch. It'll be okay, she told herself. I'll just sit on the roof till she's gone. Then I'll climb back through the window into the room. She flinched as she heard the doorbell ring again. Molly stood on the porch, waiting for the door to open. Oh my god. <laughs> Being missing had been kind of fun. No school, no responsibilities. But hiding out in the pizza factory had started to get old. She missed her boyfriend. Wait. Wait, what? What? Okay, now I'm confused. Oh, this this is like Kelsey level confusion uh, from the new kid. Um, I'll, I'll just read. Being missing had been kind of fun. No school, no responsibilities. But hiding out in the pizza factory had started to get old. She missed her boyfriend, missed regular meals and missed sleeping in her own bed. She'd gone to see her boyfriend first and now she was going to let Peyton know she was okay. Those visits were the first two phases of becoming unmissing. Then she would go back home for the required tearful reunion with her parents. Thunk. The sound came from the other side of the house. Marley ran down the porch steps to investigate. It was dark around the back of the house, so it took Marley a moment to make sense of the shape lying on the ground. But then she saw it was a girl about her size. Her neck was twisted and her head was tilted at a painful looking angle. Peyton's eyes, wide open in a frozen look of terror, seemed to be looking right at Marley. But Marley knew Peyton wasn't looking at her. Would never look at anything again. Marley screamed. Oh! <laughs> oh! I hate FNAF lore. Oh!
I'm going to run around my room for a second. Ah! ah! I hope you could hear me screaming. Um, what was this story, man? Okay. So let me get this straight. There's this, there's this person called Peyton, right? She goes to the pizza factory with Marley, her best friend. And then Marley falls into a vat. And then Marley supposedly dies. Peyton, for some reason, doesn't tell anybody that Marley is missing. Um, and then Marley eats Peyton. Right? Marley eats Peyton. And then starts to feel sick. And then sicks her out. Just like... Oh, just like how... Um, just like how Michael sicked out Ennard, uh, in some way. Um, she sicked her out, now she's in this bush, but it turns out this entire time that Marley had just been alive. What? What is going on? <laughs> Can anybody else tell me what the hell is going on? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I am confused, man. This is like, this is proper... Uh, Kelsey from the new kid, you know, Kelsey going to a new school after being springlocked. Um, oh my god, this had so many twists and turns. I am feeling lightheaded. I need to end this video because it's getting longer than I thought it was first gonna be. Oh my god, this was a story and a half. What do you guys think about it? Any theories on what actually happened? I'm gonna go and rest for like 30 hours. Uh, <laughs> I will see you in the next audiobook, which is going to be the Stitch Race, the Stitch, the next Stitch Race. <laughs> There's a little preview for you if you want to read that. Um, Stitch Race, is it? Stitch Race actually seems very short this time, so uh, we're going to get a short, short Stitch Race story. I am ready. Okay. Anyway, goodbye. <laughs>